Good morning to all my friends and family and welcome to my YouTube channel. Welcome to Jim's 5am club on this overcast Sydney Tuesday morning. I never thought I would ever be able to say that today I'm publishing episode number 1301 of my YouTube channel, my vlogs, Jim's 5am Club, and that I'd be able to boast that I'm surpassing, uh, almost doubling um, some of the greats of the past, like Aesop. I think Aesop put together or accumulated six, uh, uh, 650 fables, and today I've doubled that and if you took all of my material over the past um, one and a half years, the 1,301 vlogs, uh, the total number of words from those vlogs would uh, be close to 4 million. Around about 3.8 million, but close to 4 million, which would surpass and, uh, and be more than some of the, the books that have been written uh, to put into perspective, War and Peace was about 560 or 600,000 words and uh, my vlogs, once I um, get to the point where I can just basically get the YouTube and just turn them into text and then concatenate each vlog one after the other would be uh, a massive, massive project which would rival the greatest in the world in terms of volume so uh, as I stand here today, I can proudly say that I've got to the point where I'm probably one of the most prolific vloggers in the world on personal development material, uh, OPE, other people's experiences, book summaries, and it comes to you free of charge. So what I'd love you to be able to do for me is to spread the word that your children know, that your friends know, that your work, work peers know that this service, this free service is available to all and sundry and all you need to do is just to tap on to the YouTube channel and there are, as I said, over 1,300 um, vlogs that are available for your pleasure. Anyway, let's get on with it. Today we're going to go through another book summary uh, the way I do it is I get on the bus in the morning, I go to a, um, a, a, an internet or a number of internet sites which have book summaries, free book summaries. I read the book summary, I summarise it in my notes as you can see here and then I just basically come down here, think about it, uh, overlay the most beautiful aspects of this wonderful country that we live in, highlight them and showcase them to you and in the background I basically go through my notes and deliver a book summary trying to highlight the top two or three points to come out of the book so that we can learn and incorporate them into our lives. So today's book summary is entitled 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman. So I was scratching my head in terms of the title trying to figure out what 4,000 weeks um, equates to, but when you take 4,000 weeks and divide it by the number of weeks in a year, um, you come up with 76 years, which is probably the average life span of most people. So the, uh, the important, I guess, message to come from this book is that each of us have a, a lifetime to exploit, to make the most of, and a lifetime is a lot of time and uh, let's not uh, kid ourselves uh, 4,000 weeks is a lot of time and if you can't do something today uh, you can certainly do it tomorrow and you can most certainly get it all done within your lifetime as long as you have a plan you have a goal and you have a mission and a purpose and that you're basically trying to achieve something uh, with your life but to understand that there is importance of having a balance in your life 
where we're working and we're um, recreating. We're taking it easy. We're you know, en en engaging in leisure, um, exploiting the white time as opposed to just being busy, busy, busy all the time. And that's one of the key messages that come from this author. But let me kick off with a quote that comes from this book, which is extremely powerful and very, very profound where the author basically says to us or invites us to action where he says that confronting the worst case scenario saps it of much of its anxiety. So the author here is basically saying that we shouldn't be fearing uh, the worst case scenario, we shouldn't be living in fear, but actually articulating it and confronting, confronting it and asking ourselves what's the worst thing that can happen that in itself robs the fear saps the fear of all the anxiety and it saps it of the energy that it takes from you because you realize that uh, regardless of how bad things can can be that there is a solution to each and every problem and that the fear and anxiety that comes from um, not understanding or not wanting to confront our fears actually is the enemy and it's not actually the, uh, the fear itself but the fear of the fear. So you can induce tremendous power by confronting fears and by understanding and contemplating the worst case scenario and figuring out in your mind how you can go about sorting it out and knowing that regardless of what problems we have, we can overcome them. The author also reminds us that happiness reached by positive thinking can actually be quite fleeting. And the power that we can get from negative visualization, i.e. by looking at something and trying to understand and figure out what's the worst case scenario, and then coming to the realization that that can't trap us, that can't imprison us, that can't end our dreams, is in itself um, a, a vastly more dependable form of generating calm. So once again, uh, some wisdom to come from this author, which allows us to look at life through a different prism, through a different set of glasses, and to see the different colours and the different opportunities that are available to each and every one of us. The author acknowledges that time is the most precious resource that we have, but also acknowledges and says that time management is indeed difficult to master. In fact, the author uh, proposes and posits, posit, posits, takes the position that time management is in fact impossible uh, to master and therefore we shouldn't spend too much energy, too much effort trying to master time because it is folly to try and master time um, and it, um, it shouldn't really be our highest priority because um, trying to master time and just trying to plan our life uh, in a world which is completely out of control, out of our control to a great extent, um, creates more pressure, creates more anxiety, creates more stress than what it's worth. Uh, because if you are a perfectionist and if you're trying to mould everything into how you want to see things and how you want to live your life, um, will lead you and why you for tremendous pain. So the author then goes on to express in their first formal points, so this is the first message from this book, that if we go back and look at the past, if we go back to our grandparents and great grandparents age, we'll realise that uh, many of them came from an ag agricultural background. I know that my grandparents and parents came from an agricultural, agricultural set, um, 
from back in Greece where they lived on the land. They lived and depended on the land. They worked together on the land and they learnt that uh, their days were, um, were, I guess, influenced significantly by the seasons. Um, you could plan as much as you wanted, but if it was pelting down rain or if it's snowing or um, if something else is happening, if there's a, a village, um, Baniyiri, if there's a festival, then you can't really get on to do your work because the environment around you dictates what you do on certain days. Um, you can't basically get up and go and work when you're going to be partying all day with your family and friends um, on a particular day, say, say for example, Easter. Or as we said, if it's raining, if it's snowing, if it's too hot, you can't be out there um, harvesting and, and doing your work in your fields. You need to be able to uh, make the most of the opportunities as and when they arise and uh, not necessarily have all the time in the world to do all the things that you wanted to do on a particular day. So, uh, you know, for our parents, for our grandparents and people who came before us, you know, time management wasn't an, wasn't an important factor in terms of, you know, every hour, every day. You know, you had to select the times to go hard and you had to also understand how to make the most of the downtimes in your lives. So uh, as we said, life was more seasonable in an agricultural society. And uh, the other thing that we also learnt over the past 2000 years through Christianity and our Christian beliefs was that the afterlife was really the goal. It was what comes after we live that is the priority and more important. So what you do on earth, what you do today, what you miss out on today is not everything. And there's, uh, there's more to come. And the best is yet to come for each and every one of us. As long as, of course, we prioritize our lives um, as best we can whilst we're alive to serve God and to serve each other. Um, rather than to be selfish and to spend all our time and all our efforts just trying to uh, satisfy our own personal selfish goals. And the important thing we also learnt in the past was that development happened at a much slower pace. Um, there was always tomorrow. There was always another time to get things done. And what was more important was to spend time with family, with friends, with community, at church, um, serving God, as we said, and serving each other, rather than, you know, um, uh, achieving our own um, wants and needs. We also learnt that being busy, busy, busy wasn't the, uh, the important thing in life because by being busy, 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 uh, we were distracted and we end up forgetting about what our ultimate goal was. And our ultimate goal is to celebrate life, to thank God, to live life, to enjoy creation, um, enjoying life as it is, day by day, as opposed to not, as opposed to trying to create a life which isn't. Know, enjoying life as it is, day by day, moment by moment, and understanding that we need to prioritise and to make the most and to leave a blank, a blank time and leave time for blank for our thoughts, uh, for our creativity, and to make sure that we're uh, not pushing ourselves too hard distracting ourselves to the point of oblivion where we don't get to understand, we don't get to experience, and we don't get to live the life that we are entitled to. 
Um, it's important to make time for friends, for family, for God, and to have a thing which is called white space. White space, which is an, imp an interesting sort of uh, um, concept. To have white space in your life, and white space is basically having unstructured time. Time where you just do whatever happens, or just you know, experience life as it is. Um, and not to waste too much time planning, uh, planning to live, but rather to, uh, to live life and to live the empty time spaces, the white spaces, and to enjoy those moments. Because if you spend far too much time structuring your life, planning your life, it will and it can lead to emptiness. Now you see in the world today, you see in our lives today, there are people who are busy making millions, making billions of dollars, and yet many of them are unhappy, are unfulfilled, because even by having all the money in the world, even by having and being surrounded by lots and lots of people, if you're not connected to God, if you're not connected to your religious beliefs, to your, to your church and your church community, then you could be climbing a ladder which is against the wrong wall, is one of the key messages. It's important to understand that prioritisation and accepting prioritisation is an important thing in our lives and can lead to greater productivity. And the reason for that is that we need to debunk a myth, a myth. And the author debunks a myth where he reminds us that every single person, everyone but everyone, experiences um, procrastination. It's a fact of life. And the sooner we can accept it, the sooner that we can appreciate it, the better off we're all going to be because to a certain extent procrastination can be your friend um, because we can't function at a hundred percent all the time those ferry boats down there can't be working a hundred percent a hundred percent of the time because they'll simply work, uh, wear out and break down so we need time to be working at a hundred percent we need time to be working at 80%, 50%, 20%. And I remember reading in a book um, a little while ago, um, written by an author. The book was Remember You Can't Hurt Me. You Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. And David in his book suggests that most people operate at about 20% of their potential. Uh, which aligns to what this book is saying, that we can't be functioning at 100% all the time, but we do know and we must understand from this book, and this author also reinforces it, that we can flex from that 20% that we're operating at in terms of our potential, and we can flex up to 100% at times when we need to, but we can't do it all the time because it will lead to burnout. And that's the way we're programmed to be at the end of the day. Uh, we're programmed to live in balance and to be able to make the most of the opportunities as and when they arise, but not to be chasing too many opportunities for too much of the time, else you know, we're just running around in circles and it can lead to um, our burnout and we won't be satisfied and it's not sustainable. So the key is, of course, the message that many authors, that many cultures focus on. We need to have balance in our life and we need to have a balance between productivity and procrastination and to not fall victim to multitasking, which is the thing that a lot of us, I guess, over time have been trapped by. You know, trying to do too much, trying to be too, too many people or too much to too many people, I should be saying. So it's important to understand that 
Um, we are wired in a way that we can flex to 100% capacity and potential, but we also need to back off to manage our energy levels, to manage our gait, as we said, just like you know, a horse running in the straight at Ramwick Racecourse, knowing that the hard work is needed at the end, at the finish, or leading to the finish, and that as we enter the straight, there's going to be a rise that we will need to manage, we'll need to climb up, and we need some energy in the tank to be able to get up and over that rise so that we're not headed in the straight by other people, other problems, other challenges. So you need to have something in, res in re reserve, but not everything in reserve, just something in reserve, because the more energy we use, the more energy we have available to us. So we're not talking about being lazy. We're talking about flexing and doing things um, but, and rising to the task, but not you know, just sitting back and letting life take over and being a drifter. So the author here, once again, focuses our, 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 our attention on the importance of rest and reset. Let me say it again. We need to be able to rest and reset and in some cases, we need to be able to enjoy and to find pleasure in simply being mediocre. Uh, so the author calls to action each and every one of us to have, have um, hobbies, to have hobbies that you're not necessarily great at, things that you do that um, you know, um, ensure your mediocrity, um, ensure that we are humble and that we're not overly um, focused on being the greatest at anything. Because sometimes by just being mediocre and just doing things in itself is very therapeutic. So picking hobbies um, and also spending more time with friends and family and with God. Um, because that, at the end of the day, is the key purpose in life. You know, our purpose in life is not to have a hundred houses. Our purpose in life is not to lead uh, a corporation until the day we die. Our purpose in life is not to thrash ourselves every single day of our lives and be everything to everybody. Uh, the author here says that we need to make time for our friends. We most certainly need to make time for our family. We need to make time for our spouse. We need to make time for ourselves, but of course we need to make time for God. We need to do things which are God-pleasing. We need to add value to our environment around us, to our life, to our friends and family, as we said, to our work and our work peers. But we need to do it in a balanced way where we don't just do everything for one particular person, but we share the load across um, a grouping and a, uh, uh, a community, I guess, is the best way of putting it. So the purpose is serving God first and foremost and thanking God for all that we have, all the opportunities that we have, and expressing God's uh, love with the people around us, this unconditioned, unconditioned analogy. So I remember years ago going to a seminar uh, run by the St George Bank, where uh, Paul Clitheroe was the uh, the head, was the uh, the facilitator in the seminar, and it was a seminar on retirement, on superannuation, and I remember he post he he said, and he positioned himself with a very very beautiful, powerful, and profound question, so profound that it rocked me at my core. And he basically asks the audience a question. He says, we all need to ask ourselves this very, very important and basic question. How much is enough? How much is your enough? And he said that each and every one of us have a separate enough. And we need to come to the realization and we come, need to come to the point where we 
understand and are able to articulate what our enough is. Um, for some people, enough may, mean, may be a billion dollars, for others, a hundred million, for others, a million, and for others, enough is just to have their health, to live on the pension, or to live off their superannuation, and to basically live day by day, having enough to eat, to drink, to pay their utilities, and to enjoy the relationship that they have with their spouse, with their children, with their friends, with their community, and just to live a very simple life. So once again, a very, very profound moment in my life. And I guess something that I want to share with each and every friend of mine and, and family member of mine, that we all need to understand and learn what our enough is. You know, your father's enough may be different to your enough. Your partner's enough may be different. Your, your, spou your spouse is enough. Your siblings enough may be different as well. But we need to understand that each and every one of us have a different enough, just like we've got a different calling, just like we've got different callings. We need to try and live our lives and make the most of each and every day and to reach a point where we are happy with our lives, we are content with our enough and that we get on and live as best we can with what we have and be thankful for it. Anyway, I think I'll finish up now. So thank you very much for joining me on this episode of Jim's 5am Club. I just hope we can take some points, take some lessons, live, learn and pass them on. And I look forward to coming to you from a different place, from a different location, where we can continue this vicarious journey together, uh, where we live, learn and pass it on, where we are able to incorporate OPE other people's experiences into our lives and hopefully live a better life, a better today and a much better tomorrow. Yasas, take care and Galis Sarakusti. Today is my second day of my Lenten fast. It's the second day that I go with just drinking water. I went through all yesterday with just water. Today will be all just water and tomorrow will be just water with a few nuts and fruit um, on Wednesday evening. Then I go two more full days with just water and finish on Friday evening with unprocessed nuts and veg fruits and vegetables. And then I commence my strict fast from, from then on for 40 days up until the beginning of Holy Week and then once again, one more week of strict fast until we get to uh, Easter Sunday, where we celebrate with a feast of all feasts. Anyway, take care. Kali Sarakosti to all my Greek Orthodox Ox friends. And Kali Dinami, good strength to all of those who are fasting with a purpose for Easter. Take care. Bye for now.